and welcome to Introducing Me. I'm your host, Sarah. I started this podcast to get to know other people and lifestyles while discovering more about myself. Each episode, I'll give a new guest a chance to discuss their background, culture, interests, or whatever they want to talk about to help increase all of our own world views. Today, I would like to introduce you to Frank. He is currently a doctoral student at Texas Tech University, doing lots of good things in the music world, composing, conducting, and so many good things. So he's here to talk a little bit about, a bit about that and his life. So I'm excited to get to know him. So Frank, why don't you go ahead, say hello, and tell us a little bit more about yourself. Well, hello, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it today. And uh, hopefully you're doing well on this Friday uh, afternoon. I know that uh, for a lot of people, there's uh, some clouds up in the sky, but most definitely uh, I always tell them that even though there's some clouds up there, you know, the sun comes out and uh, hopefully everybody has an upcoming uh, Easter, obviously, if you celebrate it. So thank you again for having me. Uh, my name is Frank Duarte. I'm a composer, conductor, writer, um, class enthusiast, if, if you want to say so. I love taking different courses, and uh, I, I love to learn various different subjects. And I consider myself a long, uh, lifelong s- student, but currently I'm a doctoral student here at Texas Tech University in Lubbock, Texas. Uh, Lubbock, Texas is located on the uh, other side of uh, Texas, so not where the triangle is, not where Dallas and San Antonio and Austin and the big cities. We're a little bit closer to uh, New Mexico, and I have been here. This is my first year here at Texas Tech University studying with uh, Jennifer Jolly, who is uh, a professor here of composition uh, at the university. Uh, I am a native Californian from Southern California. So I was born and raised uh, in Orange County. Uh, for those that don't know where Orange County is uh, located, it's in the greater Los Angeles area. Um, and I was born in a, a wonderful household of Mexican parents. And I was uh, primarily raised by my indigenous Zapotec mother and my maternal grandparents uh, in Santa Ana, California, uh, which is a, a city uh, within Orange County and the greater Los Angeles metropolitan area. Um, that's pretty much uh, my small introduction. <laughs> and uh, obviously I will uh, uh, answer and uh, provide more uh, uh, with uh, within the podcast. So thank you again for having me. Great. So why don't we start a little bit, you know, growing up, what was it like um, with your Mexican heritage? What was it like where you were living? Did you fit in? Yeah, so uh, like I said, I I was born and raised in a Mexican household. My, if we go really, really far back, (laughs) my education really consists of uh, public K through 12 schools. Uh, thereafter, I went into a uh, community college. Then I went to a state university followed by a private university. And I'm here at another uh, public university. So there definitely has been a lot of schooling throughout my years. Uh, during my earlier years, if we go really, really, really far back, uh, because I was born and raised in a neighborhood uh, within a city where the city itself is predominantly uh, a, a, a Hispanic city. It's a city with a lot of uh, Hispanic people, a lot, a lots of people uh, that identify either um, Mexican, Guatemalan, Salvadorian, pretty much an, anyone that identifies as Hispanic. I never really saw myself as an outsider. I did see myself as part of the community. Uh, I grew up hearing um, Zapotec in my mother's home, in our home. Uh, I heard Spanish on the streets. I heard English on the streets. I heard Spanglish (laughs) on the streets as well. And so the, I, I saw a lot of diversity. I saw a lot of um, 
uh, lots of different people from different backgrounds and different shades, uh, but you know they all kind of identified in some way, shape, or form as Hispanic. And it wasn't really until when I went to middle school that I saw uh, someone that did not look like me, did not look like um, someone um, you know that I had met. Uh, they looked very, very different. Uh, and that person, I remember, uh, it, it was a, a white student, uh, ginger, uh, I think maybe blue or green eye. He looked very, very Irish. So I had never seen someone, I had never seen someone, I guess, with all those facial characteristics and such. So for for me, I thought that was very unique. And obviously, you coming from a background where everyone looks like you, you start asking questions, uh, where are your parents from, or what part of Mexico <laughs> your parents are from, because you assume, you automatically assume, right, that you know every student is from where your parents are from, because that's all you know. And little did I know that obviously, you know, the kid was from from somewhere else. So um, it was it was quite interesting seeing someone uh, that did not look like you um, in middle school. Okay. Now regarding teachers, though, uh, I had um, I was in a dual immersion program, so I was taught in both English and Spanish, and a lot of my teachers. Um, they mixed, they, they, you know, they were mixed, they varied. So in terms of language, some, some, I had immigrant teachers. Uh, I had a teacher, I think a fourth, my fourth grade teacher, I believe she might have been by, uh, let's see, I think she might have been from, uh, Nicaragua or something like that. A country down in Central America, essentially. Um, and I had my second grade teacher. She was she was white. Um, I heard I had my first African American teacher in seventh grade. She was my PE teacher. And so, even though I didn't see the diversity within the student population, I did see some of that diversity in um, my teachers. And so I thought that was uh, interesting. Obviously, when you're very, very young, when you're 8, 9, 10, sometimes you don't ask yourself these questions. Sometimes you do. Um, but uh, it never really crossed my mind why, you know, there was a interesting, uh, um, you know, imbalance of, of, of the diversity between the students and the teachers, right? Um, so yeah, so uh, elementary school, middle school. Um, you know, to answer your question, if I, you know, fit in, I think I did for mo for the most part. <laughs> for the most part, during elementary school, I did. Uh, middle school, that is around that time that I felt that I was a little bit different from most people. I know that around that time, I I started noticing that. Uh, a lot of the the male students would uh, come and make very very bad jokes, um, you know, towards my persona, my charisma, my uh, my 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 studies. Um, I would get called names and all of these things, and um, I started to wonder why that was that, and some of those names were attached, unfortunately, to uh, my sexuality. So I happen to be a gay man. I happen to be now an openly gay man. And back then, around that time, I was questioning my sexuality. And I, you know, again, being from an um, impoverished home, not having many resources, you, you don't really think about things. You, you think about things from where you're coming from and you 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 take a look at other things from the, that perspective 
And so for me, I thought, oh my God, maybe I'm reading too many books. Maybe that's what's turning me gay. Or, you know, maybe, you know, maybe I take too many showers. Maybe that's what's turning me gay. And so you, again, you, 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 you don't know any better. Okay. And I'm not saying that every middle schooler out in, in our country doesn't know any better. Of course, there are, there are wonderful, talented young students uh, that I have seen or I have met. And they are really, 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 um, you know, they're like genius, right? They're geniuses. They are wonderful people. Uh, but sometimes someone like me, where uh, you are coming from an impoverished background, you don't have a lot of resources. I didn't have a computer around that time. Uh, we had a family computer. I didn't have a personal computer. Uh, this was pre-iPhone, pre-iPad, all of those times, right? And I, you know, and again, maybe the iPad might have just released their first generation. I don't know. I, I really didn't have any. Uh, I didn't have that money. I didn't have those resources to, to Google and say, "Hey, <laughs> what makes you gay?" Or you know, what what is this all about? And so, for for a number of years, I was trying to really find myself. And I can't speak on behalf of the entire LGBTQ plus community, but what I can say that for me. When I grew up, there was always that fear of people finding out that I was gay. And so I know that one of the things that really helped me through this life search, this journey, this, um, you know, inner soul searching, whatever you might want to call it, uh, were books, lots of books. Reading uh, gets your mind going. It gets your mind off of things. It uh, makes you think. It makes you smile. It gets you sad. Gets you disappointed because your character just died. It, it just you know it works many many different ways. Okay, it's not like a faucet that you can just turn on and off. But I I see it more like a, almost like a telescope. You see something, but when you see the telescope, you see through that telescope because you can see the telescope, right? You see it in its form. You see how tall it is. You see its size. But when you see through the telescope, you see things that you didn't even realize were there. And so for me, once I started reading some of these books and I started learning more, right, about myself, I started learning about other people. That's when I started saying to myself, I think I know who I am. And I'm going to try to find that best version of myself. And once I find it, I can be liberated. I can be free. And so it took me years. I didn't really officially come out to... Um, any family member uh, as gay until I, I was in college. I, I, I came out as bisexual to my sister around high school. And, you know, around that time, what was it, 2005, 2006, 2006 I think. So, you know, what was it, 15 years ago, almost 15 years ago. Oh, my goodness gracious. You start thinking about these now. Um, you know, people out obviously, you know, had reservations. My sister didn't, but she always wanted to make sure that, you know, I was okay. And if I was sure, and I think I said, I think she said, okay, well, I'm here if you need anything. And, um, so yeah, so it was a lifelong search. Did I fit in? Did I fit in? Throughout all these years? Probably, probably not. I'm still pondering on that, right? It's it's something. It's something you, you know, sometimes you really don't realize because, again, you go with the flow. You go with 
what school is doing uh, for you uh, around, you know, when I started picking up books, I, I pick up, I, I, I'm a lover of books. I, I love reading. Um, so I don't have as much time as, you know, I used to have back then. But I, when I was in high school, I, uh, I definitely relied more on books than in middle school. Uh, because, you know, again, um, I wanted to learn more about myself and I wanted to learn more about people. So I would go to the library and I would pick up a book about Paris or a book about Rome or a book about China. And, you know, what's Chinese food? Why is this thing, you know, why do people eat this way? Uh, and in this part of the world, why do people, you know, say these things in another part of the world. What's with languages? Why do we say good morning? Why do the French not say good morning? Why do why do they mostly say bonjour? Why all of these things? And and uh, it, it was almost as if I went to school to be educated and to learn about these resources, but it was my curiosity that picked up all of these books and started learning more and more and eventually that curiosity carried me to 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 go to college i've always had a curiosity of of learning things ever since i was small so uh, i have a i like to call it a good memory i don't have a perfect memory <laughs> i have a good memory and um, when I was little, I would memorize things a lot. I would memorize phone numbers and uh, map grids and uh, coordinates and addresses and, you know, how streets, um, you know, how, you know, if they went north and south rather than east and west. And um, I remember one, one scenario where... Um, my, I believe my grandmother needed to go to the hospital and it was a very, uh, it, it was a non-emergency procedure. She just needed to go ahead and go to the hospital and they were trying to find this address. Okay. So back then there used to be the Thomas Edison maps and they, they were horizontally, they were roughly around the size of my laptop. So a roughly 16 inches in uh, length. Uh, once you opened them, they would be maybe 30 inches, 32 inches. So, so they're like wings. And you would have the maps. You would have all these maps. And if you wanted to find an address, what you would do is you would go on the back of the, of the map and look up the street. And it would tell you if the street you know, went from 1400 to 700, it's, uh, it's located on E7 or F7 or something like that. So you would go to the back of the book, you would pick up the coordinates, and then uh, that back of the book would give you the page number for you to reference to and look up that address. So I, 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 I love puzzles as well, and I love putting things together. I'm one of those type of people that, that really likes to put things together to find things and... Um, and, and just try to put them together, I guess, and ideas and, and such. And so I think that has to do with the maps. And I think all of that has to do with my curiosity. So that's, um, yeah, oh, my God, I can't believe I actually told you that story. I, I don't really tell people that story. But, uh, yeah, it's uh, the maps really helped. The books have helped me along the way. And uh, I'm just happy to be here at Texas Tech pursuing a doctoral degree. And something that I really love and cherish. And obviously, hopefully, you know, use that degree for, for a better good. Yeah, I loved hearing about all of your curiosity and just where it's taken you. Um, and there's so many questions that I could ask right now. Um, so we'll just of pick, course. We could, we'll just pick one of them <laughs> to start. Um, so what was it like when you first left California? What were your experiences oh. then? <laughs> <laughs> I first left California, and um, let's see. When, when I'm assuming you're you're asking the first time I officially left California. 
2K in 2015. Mm -hmm. I had left California for, for roughly around six weeks in 2009. And this was part of a drum and bugle core tour. I was touring with the Pacific Crest Drum and Bugle Corps that, that is based out of, I think they're still based out of, uh, Diamond Bar, California, which is a city located roughly, I would say, maybe 10 to 15 miles away from where uh, you know, I was located at that time. So not that, uh, not that far, but if you're speaking in California terms, uh, long enough that you need to wake up earlier uh, than everybody else to uh, beat the traffic. So I first left around 2009. Uh, because I was part of this tour. And uh, that was the first time I came to Texas. As a matter of fact, I believe we landed in Oklahoma. And then I came to Texas and I saw people, obviously, that looked like me around that time. Uh, but then I was well aware that this was a different state, that they ate differently, that they had a different accent. Everything was going to be different from California. Again, around this time, you know, I was in high school. Um, I, I knew, you know, my states and I knew some of the culture. Uh, I didn't know the information that I know now, obviously. But, uh, you know, I was not, uh, I wasn't too, uh, I wouldn't say I was too well versed <laughs> in the local uh lingo and the local tradition but i also wasn't uh, too naive so i was roughly in the middle okay and um i knew that around this time that i may have trouble or ordering something <laughs> and i went up to i i think i remember i went to uh it was an establishment in in dallas i think it was called the gallery it was a big mall um and I said, uh, hey, y'all, how are you doing? Or something like that. And this lady just looked at me and she said, what do you want to order? <laughs> and I, I think I tried my best, you know, speaking like a Texan or something like that. And she just, she's like, she probably thought, one, nice effort. Two, I can tell you're not from here. And three, you know, I look like you. You can probably speak in Spanish, and we'll just get the order. You know, don't have to worry about putting up a you know different accent or something like that. Uh, because again, I just didn't know if they wouldn't understand where I'm coming from, right? And then <laughs> obviously, you know, that happened, and you know, I told my mom. I said, "I'm in Texas. Oh my God, these people look like us." You know, they. It, it kind of sound like the us. Uh, they, they sound a little funny, but you know, um, I, I said, you know, this is this is quite interesting. And she said, you know what, just just be yourself, have fun, and everything. So we, did, long story short, we did a twenty state tour, and I saw a lot of places that I really wanted to see. I uh, the first time I went to a New York, not New York City, but New York, we went to Buffalo to see the uh, Niagara Falls, and I'm. You know that was one of those those things that I have I had seen in books. Uh, one of those books um, that said, you know, a hundred a hundred places to go before you die, kind of thing. You know, the, the, those books you see at a thrift shop or something like that. And so I was like, yay! I got you know one ninety nine left to go. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, I was like, how many more? You know, oh wait, you know, I I have ninety eight five more to go. You know, and so. Um, <clears throat> so that tour was fun. Then I came back, obviously everybody wanted to know, everybody in my neighborhood wanted to know, you know, what was this, 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 this thing? Um, uh, because a lot of people in California go to Mexico. A lot of people in California go to Canada, but my community again, uh, you know, uh, back then I guess people just didn't travel as much or something. Right. Um, <clears throat> that was around 2009. Now you're fast forward so many, many years later, 2015. Okay. And um, I had been to the Midwest prior to moving out. Uh, the year before I went to Chicago, I went for a conference. And in 2015, I officially 
left California. Okay, and uh, I left. I left during a time that, politically speaking, um, it was not. You know, personally for me, it was not the best. Okay, because around that time, um, Governor Mike Pence of Indiana had been advocating, and the people around his. Um, you know, tenure and around his his uh, cabinet and his supporters and all of the people around him essentially uh, were were advocating for this anti LGBT law, which essentially um, I'm not very familiar with the with the verbiage, the official verbiage of the uh, the uh, the law. I wouldn't be able to tell you verbatim what it would be. Uh, or what it was, but essentially it, it was a law that said, you know, if you look gay, you act gay, I don't know if you s- smell gay, but if you do, then we can't really serve you uh, in an establishment, and they can refuse to serve you. They, meaning the establishment, can refuse you, refuse to serve you. And around this time, I was not out to my mother. I was out to my aunt. And, um, you know, I was not out to her, but she knew that Indiana was having, you know, some issues. And around that time, also people were announcing their presidential campaign. So, you know, people are kind of chewing after each other and who, who they want their favorite, you know, candidate to be, et cetera, et cetera. I remember my mom, she gave me kind of this big one last you know, hurrah, one last president. And she said, hey, you know, I'm going to give you this one-way uh, flight, uh, you know, this ticket, you know, this ticket to this flight. I'm going to give you this one-way ticket to Indianapolis. I just want you to be to be good, to be a good person. Try to be a good person. We know it's difficult being a good person. It's not easy. It's easy being a bad person. You could do something and... You know, there you, you you know, there you go. But, um, but I also want you to be safe. I want you to have fun. I want you to be safe. And uh, you know, she gave me her blessings, and I landed in Indiana on a Sunday. <laughs> and I, uh, uh, a a person later turned colleague, later turned friend, picked me up from uh, the airport. Someone I had met at a conducting workshop. And uh, <clears throat> and the reason they had uh, picked me up was because I had a tough time finding a place to live, to rent out, essentially. Uh, a lot of places were booked. Uh, I thought I could wait last minute. Again, this was my first time living alone, uh, uh, away from the state. I had lived alone prior. I had lived alone in, in Northridge, uh, California, which is essentially L.A. Well, it's not essentially. It is L.A. <laughs> so I lived in L.A., so I, I, I knew I, I knew how to navigate those things in California, but I figured, you know, I, I don't know why I figured, uh, but I figured I could just land in Indiana on a Sunday, two days before, you know, school would start, find a place to stay. You know, and bada bing, bada boom, I, you know, everything would be covered. Obviously, you and I know that's a big, huge mistake. You never do such a thing. Mm-hmm. But again, <laughs> you know, when you're, when you don't know some of these things, okay, you you just fall back on on your what you know on your experience. And so, um, oh, and by the way, I never bothered asking people because I essentially didn't know anybody. I didn't know anybody at the school. I didn't even know this guy besides the fact that I had met him at a conducting workshop, and we had both been participants in this workshop, which lasted for four days. Okay, that duration was very small. So I came in, he picked me up, and uh, I uh, he graciously hosted me for two weeks. But during those two weeks, that so that that during those two weeks, I had a couple of experiences that I that I thought, oh, you better get very informed about here very quickly, Frank, if you want to survive the next two years. And uh, that's obviously when I and uh, where I did most of my uh, I like to say my soul searching. Uh, at Butler University. One of those situations was as soon as I arrived, I went to an establishment and I tried to, I tried to buy uh, alcohol 
kind of to do some breakfast mimosas or something like that. They don't, they, Indiana, the state of Indiana, back then did not serve alcohol, did not sell alcohol on Sundays. And I think you could only go to certain establishments. And I remember going to the, to the checkout counter. And um, uh, the person there, uh, I don't know if it was the manager or the cashier, uh, but she said, oh, you know, you can't buy alcohol on Sundays. I looked at her like she was crazy. I said, excuse me? She said, you can't buy alcohol on Sundays. You understand that, right? I said, why? She said, because it's the law. And I looked at her and I said, what law? (laughs) And she said, you're obviously not from here, are you? I said, no. She said, oh, where are you from? I said, I'm from California. Oh. I figured. She said, in the state of Indiana, we don't sell alcohol on Sundays. I was like, oh. And she's like, yeah. You heard what I said. I was like, let me put this back. (laughs) Um, Again, she was a very, you know, we were laughing it off. She was a very, very nice, very nice lady. But again, I was like, wow. Okay, well, Butler University, it's a liberal arts institution located in, in, in Indiana. I'm, you know, my curiosity level went up, you know, 5,000%. So I credit a lot of my education, really. Everything was molded at Butler University. I came out to my family uh, at Butler University. Uh, I never really, had, around that time, I also wanted to come out to to uh, a couple of other people, unfortunately, some of them, you know, moved away, and I lost track of them. I never came out to uh, both of my grandmothers. Uh, my grandfather is still living. I think uh, I'm not so sure if people have told him or not. I'm I'm pretty sure, uh, but pretty much everybody in the family knows. But you know, if he ever asked, which I don't think he should, because I think he would know again <laughs> by this point. Um, then I was obviously would just reconfirm and, and say, hey, you know, I'm gay. But I credit a lot of my learning, a lot of my friendships, a lot of my things, a lot of the things, right, my things, and a lot of the things that I uh, did that, I, um, that were fruitful, a lot of the things that I learned, uh, a lot of my mistakes, um, and, and things that I... I um, I did or probably said or uh, didn't use the right words. A lot of things to Butler University. Because now I'm in a place where people don't look like me. It was a predominantly, it is still a predominantly white institution. Now in a place, I'm in a place where there's not a lot of people, right? From different cultures, traditions, backgrounds. Religions, sexualities, heights, weights. There, uh, it, it was very almost monolithic. Okay, and so in that retrospect, because everyone seemed monolithic, that doesn't mean that everybody was there. Because I know that Butler University, in in some departments, for example, the Department of Music, uh, you know, it's not dive. It, I wouldn't say it's diverse but there is some you know bits of diversity um because of that that enabled my curiosity to further explore and to further do other things that i normally in high school would not be doing because i was in marching band i was in orchestra and i was in you know 10 different ensembles so, you know, I explored different things. I, you know, I, 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 around that time, I also picked up traveling. I started traveling with the money I would save to, to, to go to different countries and just, you know, again, pick a map, no phone, no nothing, you know, because, you know, my, my phone doesn't get Wi-Fi in, in the middle of, a, a, you know, Austria or, or something like that. I pick up a map and, and I start looking at things and learning about these things. And 
things that unfortunately you would think some teachers would teach you, right? Or they would tell you, hey, this is located here, this is located there. Um, I uh, did my first official kind of study abroad at uh, Butler University. And I say that kind of study abroad because in when I was in high school, they would take us on these field trips a lot, a lot of field trips. And uh, they would sometimes try to take us to different places that for me, they seemed like abroad, <laughs> but they were in California, right? But uh, my, my first official study abroad happened at Butler University. Okay. Uh, that doesn't mean that I had not been out of the country before. I, I had been out of the country before that. But, um, you know, I, I've been to close to 20 different countries. Okay. I speak uh, five different languages. I'm working on my sixth. Uh, I, uh, you know, my, my friends have been, uh, now they're very diverse. Okay. I guess before beforehand, I never really had friends because most of the time I would be bullied, unfortunately, during middle school. And in high school, I, I tried to sometimes avoid people in general because, you know, I wasn't the cool kid or, you know, I was annoying or, you know, I was too nerdy, too studious and all of these things. And, um, and honestly, I'm just going to put it out there as well for some people around, you know, this around that time. And, you know, unfortunately today, you know, being of a, a different ethnicity, uh, being of uh, different sexuality, you know, kind of weird for people to comprehend. Uh, and, uh, you know, they think you're weird or you're dirty, you know, you're creepy because, you know. You know, you have darker skin or whatever, and, or because you, you like men instead of, you know, someone from the opposite gender. So at Butler University, because it was a private uh, institution, a private liberal arts institution, and because of the size of the student population, I think it really enabled me to connect with people a lot, okay? Really, truly, genuinely have uh, wholesome holistic friends, um, which, I, 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 by the way, I still talk to. And I like Butler so much that I actually decided to, to take my time and really enjoy the moment. My degree program was supposed to be two years. So most master's degree programs are supposed to be two years. I expanded it to four. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> And yes, I was in debt, okay? But again, one of the reasons why I was in debt and why I expanded it to four was because, again, I, my, my, my education, my musical background, my education kind of parallels my overall education, right? Not my curiosity, but my overall education in the sense that I did not have much at the beginning. Okay, my mother, when she first came into this country, one of her first jobs was working in a tamale, a tamale factory. She would stand up maybe 12, 15 hour shifts. And, you know, she told me this story actually a couple of years ago that she was abused a lot by her employers, verbally abused, not physically abused but verbally and emotionally abused. So she was, she was working in, a, in very harsh conditions, you know, steam coming out of, you know, big pots. And, you know, she was young. I, I, you know, she was around 15, 16 when she first came to this country. And, uh, and you know, it was very hard for her to, to go through things. And, you know, she told me that one of her, uh, uh, one of the owners, so the male owner, they wanted to uh, touch her without her consent. And you probably know what I'm talking about, unfortunately. Okay, in a very malicious way. 
Okay, knowing that the guy, you know, the owner had a beautiful wife, beautiful children, you know, all these things. And so she quit that job, and then she got hired by a Chinese um, family down in Rancho Santa Margarita. Okay, and she was a babysitter for this for this Chinese family for. For a good number of months, I think it went into the years, actually. It might have been two or three years, a good set of... And, you know, she started kind of learning English little by little. She met my dad at a community theater, community uh, play, as a matter of fact. Um, Santa Ana, California uh, has a downtown. It's a it's an old city. It's one of the older cities in um in the Orange County. And so they naturally have a downtown with, you know, nice historic buildings and such. And so my mom was strolling, you know, on a weekend. Um, as the story goes, she was strolling around looking at the, you know, window shopping, <laughs> looking at some of the things on the, some of the windows and dresses and such. And someone was passing pamphlets that there was going to be some sort of play or community theater play or, or um, theatrical piece of some sort. And uh, they came, you know, my mom and my, my grandpa and my grandmother, they, they both came the following week and uh, they saw a comedy. And my dad was one of the characters. Um, my dad... <laughs> was playing the character of an indigenous man. Uh, very, very someone from up in the hills, and he had to develop a very thick uh, uh, accent for for that character. Um, and uh, it was quite interesting because, uh, you know, I never really thought about it. And I'm thinking, wow, hmm, I don't know how comfortable I would feel with that, right? <laughs> But uh, because, you know, in, 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 uh, obviously in, in Mexican society, uh, they see, at least we see in uh, also a race and ethnicity very, very different from the United States. Okay. And so we, oh, we see things and we say things that we would never say in the English language. Like, for example, you know. Everybody, uh, most of the time, and this is not just for, for Mexican families, this is for most Hispanic families, period. Uh, you know, you have nicknames. So they might have a nickname for you based on what you look like. If you look like a turkey, they'll probably call you like Wajolote or something like that, uh, which means you're a turkey. If you, you look maybe a little chunky, they might call you, I don't know, hippopotamus or something like that. And so, if for again, in the United States, you know, we... We, including myself, you know, being born and raised here, we would probably, you know, you know, raise some eyebrows and say, mm, this is not something you probably want to call your kid. But, you know, in Hispanic society, we see that not as something to demean something or use it as a demeanor, right, for someone not to make anybody smaller. But we see it kind of as a term of endearment. Okay. Uh, I know that, for example, uh, my cousin, uh, a lot of the family call him negro, okay, which means essentially black, okay, because he's very, very, very dark, okay, negro means black in Spanish. I can't imagine someone coming up to him in high school uh, or in college and, you know, calling him and saying something along the lines like, hey, you, black. <laughs> like, that doesn't happen, okay? And so, but in Spanish, it's completely accepted. And if you're smaller, they'll call you negrito, which means like, you know, little black person, right? If you're very, very tall, they'll call you negrote, which means very, very black person, okay? Or very, very dark-skinned person. Uh, because negro not only means black, but also means dark. My cousins, my other cousins, they're very, very white. Like, whiter than you are. <laughs> Blue-eyed, uh, you know, and 
I know that when I was younger, we would hear "wera" a lot, which means "Hey, blondie." Hey, you know. Even though they were not blonde, they were just very, very white. Actually, maybe maybe one of my cousins was really blonde. I never really noticed. I also have bad eyes. Anywho, I know I I went off on a, a kind of a little you know tangent here with the you know the dichotomy in Hispanic ho- households uh, because you know you're using um, <clears throat> words that you pick up and that you heard right growing up when you were when you were smaller in 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 that society in that community you use it as endearment and then here in the United States that is not something that we including myself would say that uh, to to other people because historically speaking as you probably know this some of those words have been used for for people um, including but not limited to minorities to degrade them right so it's not 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 something uplifting it's been been the opposite and uh anyways so the reason why i went off on this little tangent was because my my dad was playing this you know uh indigenous guy and so my mom obviously connected with him and she thought he was very very cute uh as she says you know your dad was very muscular he looked like arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, like Mr. Olympus and, you know, flawless skin and, and all that stuff. And I really, you know, you know, was kind of curious to see if he was going to ask me out to, to dance because they also had a reception that, that evening. And, uh, and they did, they danced. Uh, my grandparents were both, uh, watching them. <laughs> Both my grandmother and my uh, grandfather, they were both watching, making sure they, that the gentleman was very respectful <laughs> and that, uh, you know, you know, the lady, you know, was also respectful. Uh, so um, and making sure that obviously, you know, nothing south would, would happen or, you know, and nothing would happen during or after that uh that encounter making sure everybody was going to be safe and sound of course and so after a couple of dates my uh my dad and my mother they became engaged they married in mexico they then uh, came back into uh, the country and then i was born i was born the day after my mom's eighth 18th birthday so uh Teen pregnancy, let's put it that way. <laughs> and uh, so my mom is very young. She's 47 years old right now, and I'm very blessed that, you know, I still have her in my life. So that um, is pretty much, you know, regarding my, uh, my, my kind of my, my parents. Um, and even going back even further to what you asked me before, um, again, my, my mother, when, when she first came here, to this country when she moved here um, you know we just didn't have a lot to 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 work with so my musical background parallels again my education not really my curiosity um, because I didn't have much at the beginning my parents could not afford beyond two private uh, trumpet lessons while I was in high school which that Plus my my lack of knowledge on the trumpet and my musical knowledge that contributed to poor audition results and uh, many rejection letters from all the schools I applied to. Thus, it was not until my time at the community college that I formally studied music. Okay. That was when I said, okay, I'm coming to this community college. I heard, uh, and I didn't want to go to the community college because when I went to a fundamental high school, which is um, one of those kind of gifted and talented schools, right? So I knew people who were going to Harvard, people who were going to UCLA, USC, and all these wonderful schools. And here goes Frank Duarte, you know, 
he applied to USC, but you know, just because I applied to that school didn't mean I got in. Mm -hmm. So I got rejected. I think I got like 11 rejection letters or something like that. So it wasn't uh, until the community college where I uh, formally studied music and towards the end of my undergraduate degree, I formally commenced this career as a composer, all while being a full-time student and other undertaking, you know, all types of jobs. And when I got to Butler University, again, circling back to my Butler story here, um, I said, I'm going to take every single bit of advantage Right? I'm going to take advantage of the entire school and its resources and not just use that for my benefit, because that kind of sounds a little wrong to me, but you know, use the resources. If they have a, a lecture on something that I have n- no knowledge about and I find interesting and I think I would like to learn more about that and obviously I have more time, Sure, let me go ahead and sign up for this lecture. You know, two or three dollars. What's that? An extra cup of coffee, right? And I I started doing a lot of the things that I did not do in undergraduate, um, in my undergraduate program at Butler University. So essentially, think of Butler University as my undergraduate degree, right? Essentially, that's what that's what happened. I joined my fraternities at Butler University. I uh, had my first uh, open gay relationship at Butler University. Not not open in the sense that two or more people. It's just, you know, I wasn't hiding my relationship um, status. Um, it was also the first time where I was trying to learn more about my culture. You would think otherwise that your parents would teach you everything there is to know about everything. And again, my mother, you know, she comes from a very small village, small, very small village in the state of Oaxaca, which, uh, by the way, I encourage you to to visit whenever you have any free time or just go on Wikipedia and look at the articles or go on YouTube. It's uh, Oaxaca is... Um, I don't have the numbers straight with me in my head, and so don't quote me on this one. <laughs> but I think it is the second or the third. I believe it is the second state with the most amount of indigenous people in the entire state, uh, in the entire country of Mexico. And it is one of the most ethnically, one of the most biologically, okay, diverse states and places in the entire world okay so and i would even put it another one in in there not only is it biologically and ethnically diverse but it is also gastronomically diverse as well i don't even know if that's a word i think i just made that up but their you know gastronomy their their food okay is very very different than the rest of the country and the rest of Latin America. And it's pretty out there. Obviously, it is located in Mexico. You know, you have big cities and such like that. But a lot of the the, the traditions in that state are governed differently than other states. So, for example, the state of Oaxaca does that hire by the Constitution of Mexico. Right, just like the state of California has its own, you know, uh, constitution, but you know they also, you know, have to follow federal laws. But Oaxaca also has this system of customs and traditions, where uh, police legally cannot interfere because these are um, original lands, right? So these are very, very old towns okay so like for example my mom's town uh, i think it's a thousand years old thousand a hundred years old give or take okay and that was where uh people would go in there in that town and it would be a second um 
temple for the indigenous people. It was a, a kind of a place of pilgrimage uh, to go there. And, um, you know, they kind of called it the sacred, sacred temple, the sacred tomb, uh, because there was another more important prestigious uh, temple to go to. And so my mom, when she was being raised in this, in this um, village, which is still very small, for example, she, you know, she, her first language was not Spanish. Her, her, her native language was Zapotec of the valley dialect, because there are four dialects in that language. Okay, within that language, there are four dialects. And so, you know, she remembers her grandmother, you know, telling her these things and uh, in, in, the, in this language. And it's not even close to Spanish. For example, if you um, say red, like the color red in Spanish, it's rojo. Okay. But in Zapotec, in, in our dialect, it's called, uh, you would say, shnia. So, shnia. And, uh, for example, if you say, um, you know, white, the color white, uh, in Spanish it's blanco, in Zapotec, in, in our dialect, it's nakits. Very, very different. Uh, tortilla, Spanish, tortilla. Uh, and um, in Zapotec, you would say get. Like, I'm getting something, but obviously not with that accent. I just anglicized the accent so much right there. Um, and bread, you would say get still, which means tortilla from Spain. <laughs> Right, because the the Spaniards mm -hmm. came in over, so it, 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 it's very very different. So my mother, again, going back to circling back again to to the story here, um, we just didn't own much. Uh, my mother uh, went through different jobs, including but not limited to, you know, picking up cans on the street, selling flowers on the street, and. Uh, selling at flea markets. My dad uh, was not as uh, unprivileged. <laughs> he, when he first moved to this country, he settled in the Midwest, up in Chicago. Very fancy. <laughs> and uh, obviously when he moved to California, as anybody will tell you, you know, moving to California back then, as it is now, will probably make you go broke. Okay. And so for a, for a while, you know, even though, you know, he wasn't selling flowers on the street, he was working various different jobs, working as a cook, working as a, um, like as a bus boy. Uh, I think he was a host for a bit. And, uh, um, I think he was even a bouncer. So, uh, so definitely he was a, he was a busser. He was a, a bouncer. He was a, like a janitor, he was all sorts of things. And, you know, you're just trying to get, you know, a buck here, a buck there, you know, all these things. Um, put them all together and you have a nice little paycheck, right? And um, so he wasn't, uh, he was unfortunate as well. Um, you know, you know. He was unfortunate in the sense that he was lacking some of the funds, right, that other people would lack, but he wasn't as impoverished as my mother, okay? But even then, you know, as any young person will tell you, you know, grow, growing up and having kids when you're very young, my dad was, I think, 29, my mom was 18, and uh, which is a big age difference now that you think about it. Uh, you know, and they had, they already had two kids within like their first, you know, two or three years of marriage, you know, kids are expensive. I don't have them. I do hear about them. <laughs> Makes me fearful of ever having a kid because they, I feel like they come with a very hefty price tag. And obviously there's a lot of courage between having a, a kid and a lot of responsibility and such, but, um, they had to feed us. They really did. And so. I remember just growing up and not having a lot of things, but 
hear me out here. I would look at sometimes TV, and I would see commercials of you know children and and I don't know in, in Mexico and Guatemala and you know call you know call now one six six you know seven seven you know feed them now or something like that, and I'm thinking oh my god. Those children, I'm a child too, but those children really don't have anything. Unbeknownst to me, that I also did not have a lot of resources, right? All I remember is having a roof over my head and having not a lot. But for me, it was a lot because that's all you have. And so I think it would have been very different if my parents would have been very, very wealthy, very, very rich, and I don't know, maybe the IRS would have taken their possessions and then we would have been in the middle of Nowheresville, I don't know, Nowheresville, Kentucky or something like that, or, or up in Alaska or something like that, you know, with the polar bears. So because I didn't see myself as very, very, you know, impoverished, I just thought I was a normal kid. And it really didn't hit me. All of my life really did not hit me up until I think, um, really up until I came to Butler University. You know, I was away from my parents. I was away from uh, my mom. Uh, around that time, you know, three, four years later, my, my parents divorced. But, uh, but then obviously you now that you're older, right? And I think this happens for everyone. The older you get, you start reflecting on people, you start reflecting on things, you start reflecting on things that have happened to you, things, experiences, and again, you know, the jokes that were made on you, the jokes that you that you said, you know, the right words that didn't come out from your mouth, the uh, maybe some of the, you know, um, interesting uh, uh, um, things you learned, um, maybe, um, some of the things that you did that you should probably never do again, uh, like, uh, you know, mixing, uh, watermelon juice with milk <laughs> and, you know, and adding tequila to that, you know, something like that. And so, uh, but, but you know what, what I'm saying, you know, you, you reflect upon your life and you reflect on the people that have been there for you and the people that where you have been there for them. And you look at the people that have come and gone, you know, they, they, they come and go, right? People come and go from your life. And you look at those people that come and go, that have come beforehand, that are here with you. And that will be gone once you, once you leave an institution or you leave a, uh, a place of employment and such. So, um, so yeah, that's pretty much you know regarding Butler the the whole you know situation and the whole culture shock. It was a culture shock. It was the first time I was experiencing winter. It was the first time I had a you know buy a you know perka for you know for the weather. I'm like, what is this? You know, boots. Who? Nobody has heard of snow boots. Nobody has heard of you know. I saw reindeer, but I never thought I was going to cross one and you know yell at him when I saw it. I thought it was going to eat me. <laughs> you know, I, there was one moment where I went to a park in Indianapolis. I, I like enjoy. I t I enjoy sometimes taking walks, and I think I started picking this up during winter because you know during winter in Indiana, a lot of people are in home, and it's just not in Indiana. This you know anywhere where things are falling from the sky, <laughs> you don't want to be outside, and. Uh, I, we have a we had a beautiful canal. Well, they still have it. Butler still has it. They're located next to a canal, and uh, it was around this that time that I started seeing, uh, you know, those kind of yield stop signs, those stop signs, those kind of signs that you see on the road that says, you know, watch out, there are deer here, or watch out, you know, road is slippery, all that stuff. And I saw one where you know the icon of a deer, you know was depicted. I'm thinking, oh my God, I don't think I will ever see a deer around here. They, these people might be crazy. And um, I was doing, um, you know, a sort of walk by the southern end of campus. You know, they were like a bridge or something. And I saw something move from, you know, behind the bushes. And I think, I think I thought I was going crazy at that point. 
because I was already tired. I was hungry, you know. But I'm thinking, I'm like, I'm just going for a walk. I'm just, you know, go around the corner and rejog again or something. And then I saw a deer. And I let out this so loud of a have a scream. <laughs> I think my vocal pipes just went out the window because it just rushed. And it, 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 I don't know if you've ever seen a deer, but the deer doesn't just stay there, right? If if it thinks you're coming for it, right? If 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 the deer is thinking this person is out to get me, and I'm not going to be a piece of ham or a piece of whatever, right, on their dinner plate. Um, yeah, I'm gonna go after you. <laughs> and so this this deer, this you know, I was like, uh, you are moving and you are moving slowly towards me. I'm gonna go, and you have a nice day. <laughs> um, and, and, and yeah, it was a uh, quite interesting, and it wasn't the first time. Obviously, you know that was. Uh, uh, I, I love nature. I really do. It's, it's one of the things that really gets me going. Uh, and uh, that wasn't also the first time, nor the last time, I have seen a wild creature out there or I have stumbled upon it. So, uh, anywho, that's Butler University for you and a little bit about m my education and, and how the transition coming from California to Indianapolis uh, shaped me as a whole and um, kind of enlightened me in some way to to really do some inner searching and and do a lot of uh, um, education on my part and look for some answers that I I never really was was uh, given when I was in California. Yeah. Well, I've loved hearing all of your stories. I'm so glad you got to talk about your parents and the various cultures um, and to just hear how Butler was really able to help you learn so much and experience new things and be able to get you to where you are now. Um, and, you know, as you were talking, like, you know, you were answering all the questions I had in the, in the back of my mind. So I'm so grateful for everything that you've been able to share. Um, I'm sure we yeah. can continue talking for like another hour, but I can't let this podcast go on for another hour. <laughs> of course, of course. Um, so at the end of every episode with all of my guests, I ask a random question um, that doesn't have to do typically with anything you've talked about. So my question for mm -hmm. you is, what is your favorite movie quote? Whoa, I was not expecting that. Um Oh wow, Jesus! Uh, <laughs> okay, so I really have a fun fact for you, and I'm gonna keep it short and sweet to the point. Um, I'm a big movie person, but movie soundtrack person. So I'm I I don't really um, unless it's like one of my top movies. I tend to forget. Uh, certain characters let's put it that way okay which is kind of weird because i have a very good memory for a lot of things I, I have a very good memory for way too many things but when it comes to movies i don't know if it's the cinematography or something behind it that i'm just like mm. so i don't know if i can answer that i will tell you that i have a different i, I you know if you ask me if i had a, a certain quotation from a person right? Inspirational person or something, I would be able to tell you that right off the bat. Well, if you want to give uh, your favorite inspirational quote, that works too. Oh, yeah, I will tell you that one. So my favorite inspirational quote is from Maya Angelou. As a matter of fact, I have it right here. Okay, I don't know if you can see this. This is I Know Why the Cage Bird uh, Sings. Now, the quote is not from this book. It's actually um, just directly from her. And the quote is, be a rainbow in someone else's cloud. That has been kind of my, my inspirational quote, especially during this COVID pandemic, as you probably know, and as you probably hear, and as you probably have read 
on the news, on Facebook, on social media, there's a lot of people that are going through a lot of things. I lost my grandmother at Coben a couple months ago. So I was, you know, part of those people that was also going through things. And Maya Angelou has been a very inspirational figure. Uh, not only, you know, was she known for being a poet, but she was known for being really, really a renaissance person. Almost just like me. So I really connect her. Obviously, I'm no Maya Angelou. But that quote is very inspirational because, I, you know, you never understand what people might be going through. And all you can do is really be that rainbow in someone else's cloud. You'll never, um, you know, it doesn't cost you anything. It doesn't cost you money. And people, people in life, and I think I'll end with this, people in life will forget some of the things you said, some of the things you did, um, some of the jokes you made, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. And so by being a rainbow in someone else's cloud, that happiness, that joy, that kindness, that compassion, that apathy uh, is like a flower. It's like a beautiful flower. And I would like to be remembered as a beautiful flower. All right, that brings this episode to a close. I will be leaving Frank's website in the descriptions. You know, he didn't talk a ton about his music compositions because, you know, we just had so many other good things to talk about, but you can check out his website, see what he's doing there. And of course, the podcast website is in the description as well. So that will take you to all of the social media and the resources and ways to connect with different, with past guests as well. So all of that is there. And if you'd like to connect with me, my email address is in the description. I'd love to have you as a guest on the show. And that's going to be all for today. So thank you so much, Frank, for spending time with me today and to my listeners for taking the time out of your day to hear a new story. Until next week. Bye. Alrighty, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. Bye-bye, everybody. Take care.